Thank you. Thank you for the introduction and also to invite me for this presentation. So good afternoon. My name is Alfio Lazo. I work in the University of Zurich, as Tim said, and uh, I will present the activity we did with my collaborators, you see the names, for improving our library for sparse matrix, matrix multiplication. So I will not read the title again, but uh, you take from here the major points and then this is what we will present. So we'll give you the overview on sparse matrix, matrix multiplication, SPGEM. And I will focus on linear density, uh, density functional theory. Okay. Then I will introduce our library called DBSSR, which stands for Distributed Block Compressed Sparse Row. And I will move then to introduce the new algorithm we are implementing in this library based on 2.5D algorithm, uh, the one-sided implementation, MPI implementation we use it. Then I will discuss some performance results and finally the conclusion and outlook. So let's start with the description of sparse matrix, matrix multiplication. This is used in several domains. So we go for uh, finite elements simulation to computational fluid dynamics, climate simulation, big data, electronic structure. So just to give you an example, and uh, this last uh, point, the electronic structure, is the topic of this presentation. Now, concerning the challenges about sparse matrix multiplication, SPGEM, so you can summarize in a single statement. Basically, it's an irregular uh, computation, so you can have problems a lot balance because you want to distribute the data over processors and uh, it's communication bound. So you need to uh, take care of uh, how move data and try to reduce this movement of data. You can have two ways, let's see, you can have two ways to, 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 to address those challenges. So the first way is if you know a priori the sparsity pattern or your matrices, uh, the input out of the matrices, so you can use this information to, to, to improve the performance or the general case where you don't know the, the sparsity pattern, so you don't have this information, you really want to uh, have the general case, in, uh, and we follow in, in, we follow in this case study for this last case. Okay, to give you where we, an idea where we use uh, and the complexity of our calculation, so we use for simulation of uh, just nanoparticles, electronic devices, and so on, and this is an example of a complexity of systems. This is a system with the 80,000, oops. Uh, yes, 80,000 atoms, okay? And you see, we run this in 2014 on a pizza dying, the entire system, so f uh, f more or less 5,000 nodes with GPUs enabled, and it was running for 122 seconds per iteration, and we want to really run 1,000 of those iterations. So this is just to give you an idea, you know, of, which amount of calculation we really need. And uh, all of those calculation, okay, back to this, all of those calculations are based on density functional theory. Actually, we are using the linear scale in density functional theory. And in this case, uh, you, you have this formula to get the evaluation of the density matrix. And all the matrices that are here, so H and uh, S, are sparse matrix. So, <coughs> You have uh, this unknown sparsity pattern. This is just a given idea, an example. And uh, the, the elements in this matrix, are, the non-zero elements, are blocks. So here in this matrix are small blocks. Can be size of 30 times 13, but any dimension, okay, 5 times 5 and so on. And uh, the typical occupancy of those matrices is uh, uh, higher than 10% uh, to, to the dense case, but it can have uh, also less than 1%, okay? So we have a broad range of cases. And the other thing is that we want to apply on, on the fly filtering. So whenever you do multiplication between two matrices, which means multiplication between the blocks of those matrices, you want to apply some filtering. So you want to avoid the multiplication blocks. They are not satisfying given threshold. So these are all requirements for our library to address. All right? The matrix sign function that you saw before is, uh, can be evaluated in this way. This is an iterative schema. And the good point is that uh, you always require sparse matrix algebra, so you have two multiplication per each iteration, okay, to solve these problems. And then, the entire, for the entire simulation, this SPGEM is taking like 80 or more percent, 80 percent of the entire computation, okay. So at this point, I hope you understand why we really need to have a, a really efficient and performing library for sparse matrix multiplication. And here it is. 
It's called a DBSSR, as I mentioned before, what is the meaning, and is able to address all the following points. So it's written in Fortran, it's a standalone library, so we can address, uh, we can take a full advantage of the block structure of the metrics, so we can uh, 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 use this information to speed up the execution. The dense limit is important as also the sparse limit, and uh, it provides good scalability for a large number of processors, okay? So let's, say, let's see how DBSR works. So let's start with the standard metrics here, sparse metrics. Then we do randomize rows and columns, so we get uh, some flat distribution of blocks. And then we do distribute this in a 2D grid over preprocessors. This is a case with four times four. And now, at this point, you have a flat distribution of blocks, so that means also computation, okay, flops. And you can apply a dense algorithm an efficient dense algorithm for your evaluation, okay? So we used to have the Canon algorithm for this uh, multiplication. So the Canon algorithm is sitting on top for the MPI parallelization. You do the multiplication over processors, and this is the, uh, the overview of the library. So you organize uh, the blocks uh, multiplication in stacks, and then you can parallelize those multiplication stacks using OpenMP, sending to the CPU, or using a special library sending to the GPU. So, okay, we have a GPU backend for those small matrix multiplication. This is the meaning SMM. Okay, and there are developed uh, there are special libraries for that. Okay, so one library is coming from uh, from Intel, and, and mentioned before there are also libraries which are part of the package for uh, CPU and GPU implementation. Okay, so again, in this presentation, we just focus on uh, replacing the Canon algorithm with a more efficient algorithm for the distribution. Uh, of the computation. So just to give an idea how the Canon algorithm works, so you take uh, your data, C local metrics, you want to do this computation here, the C metrics is always log of a processor, so you don't move the C data, you just move the A and B. And then let's uh, generalize this uh, uh, algorithm to any arbitrary 2D grid, okay? So we take P processors, and we decompose in, uh, a number of processor per rows and columns, and we introduce a virtual topology such that, uh, just make an example here, two times four processors. So you take C plus E equal A times B. You do distribute on two times four processors. And then you introduce this virtual coordinate, V here, which is the LCM between processor, number of processors per rows and columns. So in this case, it's four. It's going to be four. So now you have the same dimension for columns in A and rows in, in, in B. So you can run the algorithm, okay? standard way to do the multiplication, and you run in V steps, okay? These are called ticks in the Canon uh, uh, way. So the number of ticks is minimum when the number of rows is equal to the number of columns, processor per rows is equal to number of processor per columns. This is the square case, of course, okay? Otherwise, uh, you have to have uh, uh, some common elements. So the worst scenario will come when you have a prime number, okay? That's obvious, because you cannot factorize in any way. So, and the number of ticks will scale as square root of P, number of processors. So then per each tick you run, uh, uh, you do a transfer of data for A and B. Again, C it's all local, you know, move C. And you do a local multiplication and accumulation over C, okay? And you run V number of ticks. So in terms of computation and communication, you can overlap them, that's fine. But unfortunately, the amount of data you are communicating per each processor will scale as a inverse of square root of p. And again, the square root of p comes from the number of square root of p ticks, okay? So this means that the, the communication at some point will be the limit of this algorithm. You require two buffers per A and two buffers per B, one buffer for communication, one buffer for computation, such that you can overlap communication and computation. So the algorithm is pretty efficient in terms of memory, okay? So now let's move how we implement the new 2.5D algorithm how we, so that we can improve the communication side of the, of, the, of the implementation. So first of all, we take our data and we decompose our data in a 2D fashion, okay? So this is as before, okay? So you decompose the data in 2D. Then you redistribute the computation in a 3D grid now, okay? You introduce this L term, number of layers, which is called number of layers, with this range, and you decompose now the computation, just the computation at 3D grid, okay? I will show you with an example so that you understand how it works. So essentially, now you have a C 
uh, evaluations per each processor. You do L local evaluation per each processor. In the previous case, it was just one C per processor. Now you have L, uh, C, and uh, you can reuse, you need to communicate A and B as usual, and then you can reuse those A and B for the local, local sorry, computation, and you're gonna reduce the amount of com uh, communication. So let's make an example. This is the easiest example. Two, four uh, two times four processor grid. Okay, as I mentioned before, you introduce the virtual topology, so you're gonna have four ticks. Okay, now you want to have two layers here. You want to have two layers. So you take your eight processors and you divide by in two groups. So you're gonna have four processors here, four processors here. These are four belonging to layer one, and these are the four belonging to layer two, okay? And now you start the computation. So in the first tick, again, four ticks, right? In the first tick, you remember K has to be the same, right? So here you are evaluating C11, okay, in the processor 11, C13 in the processor 13, and you are fetching data for A and B for processor 1111, and also here 1333, okay? So you do two communication per processor, a, a one computation. And the second tick now, in this processor, you're not continuing to, to evaluate one one. Now you move to C13, okay? So you are evaluating two Cs here, okay? Two layers, two Cs. So one three, you're gonna fetch B13, and you can reuse A11, okay? That means that you are caching A11, and you can reuse A11, you need to communicate again. Fair tick, so you reuse A, fair tick again, C11, fetch A12, B21, here is the same. And the fourth tick, the last tick, you can reuse again A12. So in total, you are taking six communication for A and B per processor instead of eight. So you're gonna, of course, you need to cache C, sorry, you need to store two I C and you can uh, cache A so that you can reuse the next tick. Okay, that's the drawback. But the other drawback is that at the end, we want to have C11, the total C11 sitting in this processor and the total C13 sitting in this processor. And now we have a partial C11 here and a partial C13 here, right? So we need to exchange per each processor C such that then we do the final C in the right position, okay? Because we want to have all the matrix in, in the right processor. So we need to communicate C11, sorry, we need to communicate C11 from here to here and C13 from here to here so that we do the final accumulation. All right. So in terms of requirements, you basically, in case of virtual topology, again, not square number of processors, you have some condition to satisfy such that you can apply layers. But to summarize, basically we take the uh, largest dimension and we divide by number of layers. If it can be an integer number, then it's fine. So let's take some example. So in case of two layers, a topology nine times two, it cannot be, nine cannot be divided by two. So you're gonna have 10 times five, which means five times five times two, okay? 10, you can divide by two. That's the obvious case. In case of square topology, you take the both dimensions, okay? And you divide by the square number of layers in this case, okay? So again, take some example. So now we have L equal four. L has to be a square number, of course. So in nine times nine, cannot be, again, nine cannot be divided by two, in times times times, you can do that, okay? So these are the requirements such that by construction, the number of processes divided by the number of layers is always a square number. This is just a matter of efficiency, okay? So that the minimum, you get the minimum number of ticks. Good, so consideration now. So let's see how this works. As I mentioned before, the memory will increase. So you're gonna increase the C memory, the memory that you require for the C matrix by a factor L, okay? For each process, you will need to store L times C differences. And of course, you need to have buffers to store A and B so such that you can reuse between ticks, okay? So you're gonna use more memory. On the other side, you reduce the amount of communication for A and B, and you reduce the amount of communication by square root of L, okay? So basically you trade memory, you use more memory for communication, that's fine, because that's what we want to do, okay? Unfortunately, then you need to also communicate the C so that you get the final C results in the right position. So you, you have L minus one more communication, minus one because the local C will remain as it is, you don't need to move, okay? That means, in total, the amount of data that you need to communicate is this factor here for A, B panels, so again, we'll reduce by a factor square root of L, 
But then you need to consider that those, are those communications, and in a sparse case, the size of C is usually larger than the size of A and B, right? Because you are multiplying two sparse metrics, and the resulting matrix will be less sparse. You have more node zero elements. So the size of C can be larger than the size of A and B. So you cannot expect this algorithm at some point will be a limit when you have a real high number of layers, okay? This is a limitation, basically. So talking about now the one-sided implementation, so you basically take your data, you organize your data in memory pools for A and B, okay? You can reuse those memory pools between multiplication. We used to run several multiplication, as I mentioned before, it's an iterative schema. And then you attach those memory pools to the MPI windows, okay? This is a RMA, so it's based on MPI one-sided communication. Then, just to make an example, a comparison, sorry, with the previous uh, DPSSR algorithm. In the previous algorithm, we were using MPI, I receive, I resend, so asynchronous communication, okay? In the new algorithm, we are using replacing, okay, the I receive with the R get, okay? So there is no sender anymore. There is a single synchronization. You just fetch data from the original position. And again, now you need to use more buffers because you don't, know, you don't need to move data between neighbors as was in the Canon algorithm. You just need to fetch from the original position. Overall, you need less communications, sorry, not less communication, less synchronizations because you need to just synchronize on the receiver side, you need to synchronize on the sender side, which is fine, and overall you need less MPI calls. So the algorithm was more flexible to implement. So now, probably the most important part of the talk, the performance. So we used three real applications, benchmarks from CP2K, which is a quantum chemistry code for uh, uh, simulations. We took the matrices from those uh, from CP2K and uh, used in the DPSSR. These are the three benchmarks representative of different occupancy. So we range between 10% uh, dense case. Again, this is the dense case with blocks, okay? So we have a lot of blocks and to large sparsity, 0.06%. For those three benchmarks, we have also different block sizes, which will impact on the performance. Okay, of, the, of the multiplication. We ran on Pitsdient uh, was uh, last year, as it was last year, so with the Kepler GPU running one single rank per node, eight threads, and using Cray MPI with DMAP. DMAP is very important in this case for RMA, otherwise the performance will slow down a lot by factor two. The number of multiplication is pretty high so that we can get a pretty stable uh, result, okay? And these are the results. So uh, P -P PTP means point to point, and the other one, one-sided, L is the number of layers. So you see this is a strong scaling result. So we take the three benchmarks, you change the number of nodes. And you see in this case, you know, you change the number of nodes, how many layers you can fit, thinking about the requirements that I showed you before. So for example, 729 was the first case where we ran nine uh, layers. It's a nine times nine times nine topology. While for example, 129, uh, sorry, 1,296 is the case where you can run four layers and nine layers, so you can run all those combinations. These are times in seconds. But it's important, now we can make the ratio between point to point, the, the, the one-sided, the new implementation. So the, uh, uh, the solid bar refers to the uh, single layer divided by, uh, sorry, point to point divided by a single layer, while the shadow part here is uh, when you apply layers, when you use layers. Okay, so if you don't see the shadow part, means that the single layer was already faster. Okay, it was the fastest in this case. So now, let's see bit for the three benchmarks. For H2O, you see that there is nice speed up when you have layers. And this speed up is expected to increase with the number of layers, uh, sorry, with the number of nodes. That's obvious, you know, because if you remember, you are communicating more nodes means more ticks, and by using layers, you reduce this amount, okay? The amount of data you are communicating. So when you have layers, here you get speed up. For the semi-empirical SE, the, this increment is much tiny. I mean, it's already, the fastest case is already with a single layer. While for the dense case, there is no significant speed up, okay? So there is basically flat equal one. Here, okay, is expected to increase because you have more nodes, but otherwise there is no really speed up going from, from, from using layers and the new algorithm. Here, for example, for this case, for H2O, you see there is a speed up factor of 1.8, okay? So it's pretty significant. Now we can correlate this information for the 
work clock time with the sides, the average sides of the, of the, of the three benchmarks for A and B, okay? So these sides, these are in megabytes, and again, now we can co correlate with computation and communication. So let's see, for the H2O, you're gonna have uh, pretty large message sizes, so that means slow communication, but it, on the other way, it's also fast to do computation, because it's sparse, because the kernels are pretty big, and you can run re really fast on the GPU. So this is the worst case, because you're gonna have uh, communication limited, slow communication, fast computation. And of course, you, you expect to improve the algorithm whenever you use layers, again, because you're gonna reduce the amount of communication, okay? This is the first case. For the same empirical, you have the opposite. The message size is pretty small, so that means really fast communication. And the computation, it's also really fast, because it was really sparse case, so there is nothing to compute in this case. So in this case, you can expect that uh, we found that uh, the one side that it's giving, giving us really good results with a single layer, it seems because the one side is uh, faster uh, for small message sizes, okay? But otherwise, there is no gain when you use layers. Okay, this was, if you remember from the previous slide. For the last case, the dense case, now you have a situation where you have really slow communication, but we have a lot of blocks to compute. So also the computation is really slow, okay? So the two, they will compete and that's fine. So in this case, you will not get any benefit when you use layers and also when you move to one-sided because there are large message to move, okay? So this case is not communication limited. The memory footprint, as I mentioned before, you're gonna, when you use layers, you're gonna use more memory. You trade communication for, uh, with memory. But this is fine because still those cases are less than eight giga and a node which has 64 giga. So there was not real problem in, 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 this, uh, in this respect. So let's move to the conclusion outlook. So yes, we introduced the two and a half D algorithm in our DPCSR implementation to improve the performance. We achieved also a factor 1.8 in some uh, communication limited benchmarks. In a real sense, we are never, you know, slower than uh, the, the, the point to point, the previous uh, implementation of the algorithm. We found that the one side that is really giving good performance in this respect, uh, it's also easier to implement respect to the point to point communication algorithm. This project will continue in a new PASC call, so for the next three years, starting this year up to, to 2020. We are looking for uh, uh, new postdocs to work with us so we can extend the project. The idea is to move to tensor algebra, so from sparse matrix multiplication, use this as a backend for a, a tensor algebra library. So there are a bunch of papers here. Of course, there is uh, the proceeding of this conference where you can find the information. Otherwise, there is the first paper on the library, and there was also the GPU implementation where you can find information. So then I will thank uh, CSS to provide us access to the machines. And it was that time at Pitsdine and Dora, now it's just Pitsdine, of course. And the PASC for founding the, the activity, and thanks to, to you. Okay, thank you very much, Any Alfio. Um, do we have some questions for Alfio? I hope it was I, not too, too much technical. In this I sense. have one question. Sure. So you showed three benchmarks that you described as real in italics. Yeah. Yes. Can you describe a little bit more about what types of physical systems these might uh, refer to? These are linear scaling tests. So I'm not really, I cannot explain to you the real, the science behind those guys, but yes, that took me as a real example case. So presumably H2O, Linear scaling Correct. is, is some sort of liquid Correct. water, yes. um, and something which is more in the the other one is dense the side. So it's the same empirical. Yes, again H2O. Yes, we used to test with a morph. We used to test, it, you know, other test cases, but these are you know representative of you know sparse matrices, big matrices, uh, and so on. Okay. The code is in real production, so anyone can use in the. This is again just representative of three kind, three cases. But 
it's not just with respect to these cases. It can be used in other, any kind of is part of CP2K. So I have one more question. Um, how would you compare, um, or how would you describe the perf relative performance of this DBCSR on uh, GPU versus on CPU. the CPU mini core system? Yes, yeah, so the, uh, we have a poster, and there will be tomorrow. And yes, we will show performance running on Tave, so the KNL system. And uh, just showing the DBCSR performance, uh, let's do it this other way. Uh, the GPU system, so Pits Dined, is roughly 15% faster than Tave, node by node, okay? So we are running on 144 nodes. The maximum I can fit in a square case, 12 times 12 on Pits. Well, I can fit 169, but it's going to be 13 times 13. So, yes. So the GPU, okay, these are just recompiling the code they're running on Tave. Nothing special, no fashion stuff in there. So, and the um, thing is for that those who are not familiar with the CSCS systems, Tave is a KNL based uh, Knights correct. Landing system from Cray. Yes, it's a single rack, so you have 180 nodes basically. Yes, so I, we, we did the comparison with, the, with, the, with the, uh, the GPU system. And again, as I mentioned before, yeah, you, all the small blocks multiplication will run on the GPU. So depending those number I told you, it really depends on, on, on the size of those blocks. So for large size, the GPU is really winning. I mean, it's twice faster than the kernel. For those more si small sizes, it's the, GPU, the CPU, CPU is a bit better. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Any final questions from the floor? One. Um, please use the microphone. Thank you. Yeah, you showed this for uh, sparse matrices, but is there any impediments to use this also for dense linear algebra? Let's say uh, dense matrix in a strong scaling limit? So first of all, you need to have blocks. You can assume that you have blocks by one by one, but you know, this would be a huge overhead. <clears throat> so we did test uh, using comparing to LibSci the accelerator one, just to see the scaling of this, if you can scale. And the library is performing really well. So in, uh, I think the full dyne was three times faster than LibSciAC. But then you really need to have a really large block. So when I say large means 50 times 50, we were not able to you know, have larger blocks. You know, this is dense case, so you can increase the, larger, the, the dimension of the blocks. Okay? So you reduce the overhead to you know, making all those blocks, multiplication, and so on. But the, then the library is really performing well in that respect. We have time for one more question. And sorry, to conclude, on the, on the new system, of course, Pascal, those performance are much better. Now you have more registers and so on, so you can have even bigger blocks. But I don't have those numbers. Okay, thank you once again, Alfio.